Hi, everyone. So I think we're going to get started. Um, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, this is being recorded. Uh, and so for those in person for the Q&A, you can come up here to this microphone. Uh, I'll be monitoring the chat on Zoom. So anyone virtual, you can submit your questions and um, I can ask, ask it uh, here in person. So my name is Leland Taylor. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in Francis Collins Group uh, here at the NIH. NIH GRI. Francis uh, wishes that he could be here, but unfortunately he has a conflict, so I am hosting today. Uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Logan Mulroney. Uh, Logan is an authority on all things uh, nanopore sequencing. Uh, so he earned his Bachelor of Science and his PhD at the University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, where he worked in the nanopore group under the mentorship of Mark Atkinson. From there, he moved on to his postdoctoral fellowship, which is a joint program based at the European Bioinformatics Institute and uh, the Center for Genomic Medicine at the Italian Institute of Technology, where he worked closely with uh, Francesco Nicasio and then Ewan Bernie. So a quick plug, Logan is starting to uh, look for faculty positions. So if you know of any opportunities and you uh, like what you see, uh, please reach out. Uh, as I mentioned, Logan's research focuses the role on the role of chemical modifications on top of DNA and RNA, so the, the epigenome or the epitranscriptome. Uh, he's pioneered wet lab and computational techniques to directly read these modifications from nanopore sequencing data. Today, Logan is going to be sharing uh, his latest research uh, in the talk entitled Investigation of RNA Modifications Associated with Glucose Stimulation in Pancreatic Islet Beta Cells. Uh, this research, we're actually, is done in collaboration with, with the Collins Group, explores how RNA modifications change in response to glucose stimulation and has a number of implications for various diseases, most notably type 2 diabetes. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Logan Moroni. Well, that was a very kind introduction. So thank you, Leland. And thank you for having me here to give a talk about some of my work. It's always a pleasure to talk RNA mods. Um, so to first, I feel that most people skip through the, uh, the acknowledgments at the end of their talk and rush when they're out of time. But I really just want to highlight that this work would not be possible without the wonderful people I've had the opportunity to work with. Um, my lab in Italy with Francesco Nicasio, my lab in England with Ewan Bernie, and then the collaboration here with the Collins Lab. Um, it's been a great group of people to work with, and this work would not be possible without the variety of funding sources um, that have supported me through this. So with that, thank you all, and let's get started. So RNA modifications are chemical alterations to canonical nucleotides. These can be on the the sugar backbone, they can be on the nucleotide, they can be on the ends or internal. Practically every RNA molecule that's synthesized by the cell gets modified in one way or another. And they can be simple, like adding a methyl group to um, different positions, or they can get kind of complicated and adding large ring structures. Um, and there's a lot of them. So to date, there's about 170 known RNA modifications between the three different branches of life, uh, separated between the three, and then there's an overlap um, that are consistent between all three. And these are kind of the foundational modifications that we see a lot in mRNA, tRNA, and ribosomal RNA. These are also dynamic. So there's a class of enzymes called writers, and these will convert the unmodified form to the modified form. And then there are erasers that then do the opposite. They take the modified form and turn it back to the unmodified form. And then there's a class of proteins called readers, and these interpret the presence or absence of an RNA modification in its context and set up the cellular response based on if it detects the modification there. Um, and so for one of the more well-studied RNA modifications, M6A, which is N6-methyladenosine, um, these are the examples of writers, erasers, and readers, um, at least a subset of them. RNA modifications are also involved in basically every aspect of RNA function and regulation. Uh, as I said, almost every molecule is modified in one way or another. And these modifications can be deposited 
co-transcriptionally, post-transcriptionally, they can be deposited in the nucleus or in the cytosol. They're involved in processing, maturation, in translation, involved in RNA decay. And so they're kind of ubiquitous to the function and regulation of these modifications. And then in this context, it's also been found that one of the more well-studied modifications, M6A or N6-methyladenosine, is reduced in the context of high glucose or in type 2 diabetes. And so this was a study published uh, two years ago where donor um, human beta islet cells were either challenged with glucose or were diagnosed as type 2 diabetic. And overall, the M6A content in the RNA from these um, samples was reduced uh, in the context of glucose or type 2 diabetes. Furthermore, another study that was published um, a few years ago using a different technique to look at uh, M6A methylation found that a series of these genes in a key type 2 diabetes pathway were also had a reduction in M6A. And so all of the genes here highlighted in um, this kind of orange pinkish color were reduced in M6A content compared to the uh, control. And here's just an example of what the raw data looks like that, uh, where you're pulling out M6A molecules based on an antibody binding. And so with this, we were interested in what other modifications might be associated with type 2 diabetes or genes or in glucose stimulation. And then do these RNA modifications have a mechanistic role in the glucose response? And can disruption to the RNA modifications themselves result in a disease phenotype leading to possible targets for early detection or therapeutics? And so this talk will mostly focus on just the first question, because without observation, you can't do the other two. And so there are a variety of techniques used to study RNA modifications. And these range from biochemistry methods, mass spectrometry, or short read sequencing techniques. With mass spec, a lot of these RNA modifications have been discovered using that technique, but it's really difficult to get the sequence context for the modification. And doing an entire transcriptome-wide mass spectrometry experiment is really, really challenging. So you kind of are limited to a small class of molecules one by one. And then with the next generation sequencing techniques, you kind of have to have one assay for one modification. And so here's an example of where you either have an antibody targeting a specific modification and you're pulling down molecules that are modified. And then when you do your um, short read sequencing, you're looking for the peaks in your data of where that modification was enriched for. Or you have a chemical that will interact specifically with the modification of interest. And this can cause things like cause strand breaks or a reverse transcription hard stop. And so in your sequencing data, you look for these regions of hard stops in your data and that's where the presence of a modification was. Or in some rare cases, like with inosine, um, when you do reverse transcription, systematically the wrong nucleotide base pairs are across from the modification. And so in your sequencing data, you can detect it that way. But there's only a small number of modifications that can be detected, and you have to have this specific assay for that specific modification. And so it's one experiment, one modification at a time. So now an emerging approach is nanopore sequencing and specifically direct RNA nanopore sequencing. And so this is the case where the RNA molecules are sequenced directly without conversion to cDNA. And so this avoids PCR and RT biases. And also the modification signal is captured in the raw data and isn't erased by this um, conversion. Um, and you can sequence the entire transcript in a single read. So we can start looking at uh, modifications in the context of the whole transcript. And so just for those who are not super familiar with how this technology works, you have a nanopore embedded in a membrane and that separates two aqueous compartments with salt water. And then the nanopore is the only location in that membrane where the salt can translocate from one side of the membrane to the other. And then you have a motor situated on top of the nanopore that regulates in a controlled uh, fashion the nucleotide polymers through the nanopore in one nucleotide steps. And then that salt is going uh, through the nanopore according to an electropotential that we apply uh, 
a voltage across the membrane. And so we're measuring the current that is carried by the salt through that nanopore. And when the nucleotides are passing through the pore, they physically take up space and actually block some of that salt. And so we see a reduction in the ionic current. And that's what we're seeing here in the squiggle along the bottom, which is the raw data coming off of the sequencer. And so as each nucleotide progresses through, it has a unique effect or characteristic effect on the ionic current. And these are deflections as the ionic current is reduced. And so this is what a typical direct RNA molecule looks like. This is our raw data coming off the sequencer. We sequence starting from the three prime end and progressing through the five prime end. And so what I have here is around 300 uh, picoamperes on the y-axis is where the open channel. That's an empty nanopore that's waiting for a molecule to be sequenced. And then that first part is the, ion, is the ionic current for the adapter molecule that we ligate onto the end of our RNAs. And then that long pause there is the poly A tail. So the current protocol requires poly A tail for the ad adaptation chemistry. And so it's a long sequence that doesn't change. And so ionic current space, it looks like a dial tone. And so it's a very flat signal. And then when you exit the poly A tail and get to the rest of the uh, RNA sequence, you now get this bottle brush appearing uh, signal. And that's the rest of the molecule translocating through the pore until that molecule exits the pore and it goes back up to open channel, which now that nanopore is empty and waiting for the next molecule to be sequenced. So RNA modifications alter the ionic current relative to the canonical nucleotides. And this can be detected in the data. So what is here is an experiment where we sequenced E. coli 16S ribosomal RNA from wild type, which is in blue, or a mutant which deleted the gene responsible for depositing an M7G at position 527. And that's in red. And so the ionic current upstream of position 527 and the ionic current downstream of position 527 is roughly the same between the two conditions, but where the M7G is supposed to be deposited is different uh, between these two conditions. And so we can use these changes in ionic current between the canonical and the modified forms to look for the positions of modifications in the data. And so this is software. Um, there's lots of different software tools that have come out over the last few years, but this is one that I specifically work with called NanoCompore. And this compares the ionic current in two different dimensions using Gaussian mixture modeling and then logistical regression to find the differences between these two samples. Um, and it doesn't rely on any kind of model training. And so it can be updated with changes to octal nanopores chemistry, but with some caveats. And so the control sample that we use to compare our wild type data against has a huge impact on what kinds of modifications we can detect. And so broadly speaking, there's two strategies uh, when you do these comparative ionic current tests. The first is where you have two different samples. One is a wild type and one has some sort of disruption to the RNA modification writing machinery. And so this can be a knockout or a knockdown of say the M6A writer or a chemical inhibitor. But these have to be tolerated by the cells and non-lethal because if you kill the cells, you can't get the RNA. And it's also two different samples. So there are gonna be slight differences between the two um, that could be transcriptionally driven because of the changes to the um, writers that you disrupt. And it's limited to the modifications that are dependent on the disruption that you make. The alternative is to use something called in vitro transcription, which is where we make RNA in a tube that is of entirely canonical nucleotides. And we can make a copy of the wild type transcriptome. And so in this way, it's one sample. And then we have our, in, our synthesized copy of canonical nucleotides from that original sample that only is made up without modifications. And so we can test where the modifications are for every modification simultaneously. And so roughly how this process works is we extract the poly-A RNA from our cells, and then we separate half of that to go to na native RNA sequencing, and that will be our wild type sample. Then the other half will go through a process where we make a cDNA template of the RNA with a template switching oligo, and that will add the T7 promoter onto the five prime ends of all of our RNA molecules. The T7 promoter will then uh, 
will work with the T7 polymerase, which will make the RNA then from all of our transcripts, and that will act as the template for making our RNA. And so now we have an RNA sample derived from the original sample that is devoid of all modifications. And there are some biases of the T7 polymerase, so we do a follow-up poly-A tailing to make sure that every synthesized molecule is captured by the nanopore because there can be incomplete synthesis products. And then this IVT RNA is sequenced in a separate flow cell with our wild type, and then we can do those comparisons. And so for this study, we had um, the endo-C BH3 or BH3 cells that we grown in two different glucose conditions, and we had this in two different batches. So in total, we had four um, at high glucose and four at normal glucose, and we generated a number of IVT libraries and native libraries from these different designs. And so blue is our low glucose, and yellow here is our high glucose. And just as a quality control check, we did make sure that insulin was um, changing in response to glucose, uh, because if the insulin isn't changing, it means the cells aren't responding to the glucose at all. So this was to make sure that the cells were behaving the way we expected. Now, with all science projects, some things change in the middle of multi-year projects. And Oxford released a new sequencing chemistry right as we got our IVT samples ready. And so this changed the RNA004 chemistry, um, had a lot of benefits, but one of the downsides is they changed the format of the raw data that they save. And so now nanocompore doesn't work because we can't do the comparisons. However, along with this, they put out a model specifically calling M6A from a single sample without needing to do comparison and also pseudouridine. So while we are trying to update nanocompore with this new data format, we could at least use the models released by ONT. And the other benefits of the new chemistry, we get higher accuracy as depicted here, the median accuracy increased by about 8%. And we also get about two to three times the throughput from a single flow cell. So we're getting more data, more accurate data with this one little hiccup. And so here's just a summary of the number of reads we got from our native and our IVT samples. So the native is in the top table and the IVT is in the bottom. And on average, we got about 17 and a half million reads um, from our native samples, with the lowest being 9.6 and the highest being 21.4 million reads. And then with the IVT, we got a lot less data, but with the IVT, we don't necessarily need the same kind of throughput. We just need to make sure we get even coverage across all of the positions to do these kinds of comparisons. And so getting two to three million reads from that is not unexpected and not too much of a problem. And just another quality control check to make sure that our glucose conditions were behaving a little bit differently is our high and our low glucose conditions transcriptomically were separating in the principal component space. Um, so we were comfortable moving forward uh, with the modification column. So one thing is Oxford says you should trust us, and I say most of the time. Um, there's a false positive rate associated with any of these models for detecting um, these modifications. And so the IVT sample, which shouldn't have any modifications, acts as a really nice negative control. And so doing the modification calling on both the native and the IVT samples gives us a chance to kind of check some of our filtering parameters that we were going to use for the study. And so here I'm showing the 16 samples all together. Um, the first eight are the native samples, and the second eight are the IVT. The top row is for M6A, and the bottom row is for pseudouridine. Each column is a depth threshold that we use, either 10, 20, or 30 reads. And then each set of columns is a stoichiometry requirement. So at least 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, or 30% of the reads at those sites had to be called as modified. And when looking through kind of these different parameters, we kind of settled on 20 reads at 20% stoichiometry as being a reasonable set of thresholds for both conditions. But we saw separation between the IVT and the native that was expected. The false positive rate in the IVT was lower than um, what Oxford said we should expect. And the rate that we're getting from our native data matches kind of the expectation we see from mass spectrometry data. And then looking at the distribution of these sites after using those filtering conditions um, across a metagene. And so this is looking at kind of an, an average across all transcripts into the three, or all mRNA transcripts 
across the three major regions of the transcript, the three prime UTR, the coding region, and the five prime UTR. For M6A, the distribution that we see here is exactly what we expect given the literature. There's a concentration of M6A near stop codons, and that's been described over and over and over again for the last 15, 20 years. With pseudouridine, we actually expect it to be more even, and so to see a peak at the stop codon is a little unexpected. And some of this might be due to still the three prime end coverage bias that we see in uh, direct RNA sequencing. But we felt that this was reasonable enough to move forward with these um, detection parameters. And so we wanted to now look at how the modifications were changing over time, or sorry, not over time, between the two different uh, conditions. And so to do this, we're kind of now borrowing statistics that are applied for allele specific expression. So we have these two modification states at single nucleotide precision and single molecule precision. And so we can treat the unmodified form as the reference allele and the modified form as the alternative allele and use uh, binomial regression to look at how the ratios of modified to unmodified are changing in response to glucose. And so in this kind of toy example, we have five reads from the low condition, five reads from the high condition, and there's a difference in the modification stoichiometry, and that goes into our binomial regression. And so the results of that um, were about 2,600 isoform resolve sites that had a difference that were statistically significant at 5% FTR that, uh, for M6A and 1,500 for pseudouridine. Um, and so we were happy to see that we found some differences. And looking kind of more closely at these, uh, here's just like a summary of kind of all the filtering conditions that we used. Going into the binomial regression, there was a little over half a million, there's 674,000 sites that were used for the binomial regression from 6A and 1,500 for pseudouridine. Um, to get more confidence and power, uh, we filtered positions where we had at least 150 reads mapping to those positions. And with that, we got 79,000 for M6A and 1,500, um, or 15,000, sorry, for pseudouridine. From this, we got 2,600 significant sites or 1,500 significant sites. And then when we compared this to previous literature for sites associated with um, type 2 diabetes, we found 63 that were significant for M6A and 26 with pseudouridine. And here's just the top five on significant hits from this list um, from a variety of genes that we expect. Um, and I want to point out here that the IGF-2 gene is on two different isoforms. And so we can start looking at these RNA modification changes on single isoforms. And so we'll take a look at a couple of these. So the first one, and I apologize for the blurry image, um, but this is the transcript model for the PDX1 gene, starting with the five prime end uh, on your left and the three prime end on your right. And then the six, sorry, seven um, M6A sites that were found significant on PDX1. And in this case, all of these M6A sites were seeing a reduction in the ratio of modified to unmodified um, when we expose to glucose. And this matches the expectation of what was found in previous um, literature. So this is within our expectation and is consistent with what other groups have found in the past. And again, we see that these M6A sites are concentrating um, kind of in the three prime UTR or in and around the stop codons, which is also where we expect to find M6A. And then another gene, um, this RFX6, we find three different M6A sites uh, in this third to last exon. And two of them were seeing a reduction in the ratio, and one of them were seeing an actual increase in the ratio uh, after glucose exposure. And so these ones that we see decreasing are the DRAC or the canonical DRAC motif. And this DRAC motif is the known recognition sequence motif for the main M6A writer in humans called metal three. And for those not don't have their uh, degenerate nucleotides code memorized, DRAC would be either an A, G, or U in the first position, an A or G in the second position. The A would then be the modification site, which I have underlined, a C, and then um, not G. And so the one site that we see go up doesn't quite fit the canonical DRAC motif because it has that C where we expect to be an A or G. 
So this is either a non-metal three dependent uh, M6A methylation or an off-target M6 uh, metal three methylation, which is unclear from at least where we are now. But it is interesting that the canonical sites are going down and the non-canonical metal three site is going up. And then the other interesting thing that we found was in this gene FOXA2, that pseudouridine is increasing in its uh, stoichiometry, where the M6A is mostly decreasing. Um, so here I have the 5 prime end and 3 prime end flipped on the gene model. So be aware, we are finding most of the sites, again, near the 3 prime end. Um, and pseudouridine increasing in response to a glucose stimulation has not previously been reported in the literature, as far as I could tell. Um, there was some people trying to look for pseudouridine in circulating RNA and blood serum for type 2 diabetes patients, which was inconclusive. And so finding pseudouridine kind of increasing in its stoichiometry is something that people have been speculating about, but no one's really found before. And again, we can see this on both isoforms, um, that the pseudouridine is increasing. And those two M6A that go up are also not DRAC motifs where all of the ones that go down are indeed DRAC motifs. And then one other example here is the IGF-2, where we found um, evidence of modifications on three different isoforms. Um, all the modifications except for one found in the three prime UTR. Uh, and again, predominantly, we're finding that pseudouridine is increasing in its uh, stoichiometry compared to um, when we expose with glucose. And then there's a mix of the M6As, and here there's a mix of the DRAC and non-DRAC that are, we're finding, increase. And then the last example I want to talk about is with uh, insulin. And so with the insulin transcripts, we found evidence of modifications in three different isoforms here. And all three of these significant sites are found um, in the 5' prime UTR. And all three, we find evidence of increasing in their stoichiometry. And insulin is definitely a gene that gets turned on in expression during glucose response. And so this may um, be a response of that. And so just to wrap up, um, I want to say that we could use the direct RNA-seq to detect RNA modification ratio changes in response to just one hour of glucose stimulation. And at present, the in vitro transcription sample is a useful negative control. And we're planning on using that to detect other types of RNA modifications uh, once we can update nanocomport to handle the new data type. And we found on the order of 2,600 and 1,500 um, M6A and pseudouridine sites that are significantly different between the two conditions. And among these, 60 and 20 were um, associated with type 2 diabetes genes. Um, and the M6A sites were consistent with uh, previous literature, and the pseudouridine is something new that we need to explore more. And so how does this line up with our biological questions? Well, we found that maybe pseudouridine might be involved in the glucose response. Um, and we want to look at other types of RNA modifications. And so as new models are produced by the community or Oxford Nanopore Technologies, we expect to apply those uh, to these data sets to explore the other types of RNA modifications. And again, also in Nanocompore, we finish that update, which should be in a matter of weeks. Uh, we'll then do the comparison between the IVT and the native data to find all possible RNA modifications at the same time. And then trying to understand if these RNA modifications have a mechanistic role in the glucose response, will require further experiments to disrupt the deposition of those modifications with or without the glucose to see if we can um, get the cells to look like they're either not responding to glucose or responding to glucose with or without glucose. So this will require further experiments based on what we find with this initial um, study. And then, can we just change the modifications alone and get a glucose type response? And that will start getting us more and more at the mecha mechanisms involved in the glucose response. And so again, this work really would not be possible without the fabulous collaboration with the Collins Lab and my lab um, in Milan, Italy and the EBI. And I have lots of time for questions. That was great. Um so what's the thinking about these RNA marks? Is it that 
like a haplotype where there's five or six of them, but it's really one that's the business site, or is it that they are they function as a group together to have a physiologic effect? That is a really excellent question. Um, so I think based on most of what we know is going to be M6A, so I'm going to talk about this from an M6A perspective. There seems to be that's kind of both, depending on the context. Of course. Um, but for the most part, it looks like with just a few M6A marks, you get efficient translation of the protein for coding regions. And then you need enough of the M6A to get efficient um, translation. And then if you get too many, you then target the RNA for destruction. And so there's kind of like a stepwise equation for the number of M6A marks on a particular transcript will change its function. If you get too few, you stop translation. If you get too many, you destroy it. And so there, that's kind of like a the broad lots of marks answer. And then in other situations, a single mark can change the alternative splicing. So if you methylate the three prime um, splice site, you can switch which isoform you're using. And there's a few examples in the literature of that happening. And so some of it depends on where the mark is um, and what it's, so it's gonna be context dependent. And so I think we have to keep those in mind as we explore the functional role of the marks that we're finding. But I assume you meant where the mark is more for the latter example. Yep. And for the former example, it sounds like it's more of an additive cumulative effect. Yeah, uh, in the three prime UTR, it's an additive cumulative effect. Got it. And so if there's six of them, does it matter where they are? In the it's additive effect? Unclear right now. Okay. Um, so for proper translation, you need a few M6A in the three prime UTR for um, the efficient formation of a loop structure for the ribosome to start loading and translating. And so there can be some kind of, it doesn't matter so much exactly where in the three prime UTR, but some of it might be kind of a open air question at the moment. Thank you. Well, thank, great question. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm uh, I'm coming in from online. Uh, so we have uh, an anonymous attendee asking, uh, did any of the M6A modifications associate with decreased expression or stability of that transcript? Um, so we haven't looked at that specifically at the moment yet, but it's one of the things that we are planning to look at um, in the coming weeks. But it's the what we should be doing very eminently. Um, and maybe, uh, so one of my questions, uh, how many modifications do we know in, in human, uh, in, do we know the, what, how many do we know the readers and writers? Um, do you have an idea of the readers and writers that might be driving the, or be uh, transmitting the signals of the glucose stimulation in these cells? Um, no, so yeah, um, for M6A, it's much more understood than other marks. So in mammalian mRNA, there are 13 modifications that we know of to exist um, in total for mRNA in mammals. And M6A is the most prevalent. Um, and so the main, the primary writer, there's one, and it forms a complex, and it's metal three, and it forms a complex of metal 14 and WTAP to um, methylate mostly in the three prime UTR. Uh, for the other marks, there's a much less known, but for example, pseudouridine, there are 14 known um, pseudouridine writers, and there's no known erasers of pseudouridine. Um, Whereas for M6A, there are two known eraser genes. And then the writers, there's dozens of them for both marks. Um, so with other modifications, it kind of variable, like with inosine, there's the ADAR enzymes, um, which you look at double-stranded RNA to then start making the A to I edits. Uh, M5C, there's two main um, writers, NSUN2 and NSUN6, that have been shown to interact with mRNA. And then the readers are less known, and I don't, 
I don't know if we know the erasers for M5C. I just don't know. They could be. So it's kind of the Wild West. Yes. <laughs> Vess has another, and then we have a few more questions. Um, yeah, for the readers, I mean, for the writers, mm -hmm. um, if you have a null uh, variant, does that like globally knock down those marks then? Yeah, so um, the metal three double knockout in is lethal in embryos. So during development, if you don't have metal three, you die. Um, and we have we have used a metal three chemical inhibitor, and when we do that, we see about an eighty-seven to ninety percent reduction of M six A within twenty-four hours. Um, so it's a huge, and it's the when you start messing with that primary metal three catalytic component of the methyltransferase, it, within hours, you start seeing massive reductions of uh, M6A. With the other writers, it's less clear, um, but with M6A, we know that it goes pretty quick. And then you, in the readers, um, some of those that look like gene designations did not look like human gene designations to me. Are those human genes or are those... There are a mix of human and mouse gene designations for a lot of the reader like naming conventions. Um, in human or in mammals, they're the, um, I always mix up two letters, but it's like the YDTH class of genes. And there's a, about a dozen or so of those. Um, and they interpret M6A in a variety of different contexts and some lead to the destruction of the RNA, some lead to preserving the RNA, um, and it seems that some interact with the fact that M6A can have a slight effect on the folding, um, and so they detect either the folding changing or the actual presence of the methyl group there. So those are much more context dependent, and there's a lot of them. Um, so are there phenotypes associated with loss of those genes? Um, there are, but they tend to be uh, like smaller effects than with the writer loss. Um, and there's a lot more evidence that they're involved in a lot of the different cancer phenotypes. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't remember all of them off the top of my head. You don't have to. Thank you. So coming back in online, one of them, uh, we have a question on, do these modifications alter RNA folding? But you've... Uh... Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the methyl groups on M6A tend to have a minor effect on folding, but with pseudouridine, it's a massive effect. Um, so with pseudouridine, because it's a, it's a stereoisoform compared to the base. So if you have the base, the sugar backbone in the base, the base is kind of rotated about 90 degrees relative to the sugar backbone. And it changes the Watson Crick and Hoogstein faces relative to the backbone. And so it really changes how it can fold, where the methyl group on M6A has a very minor impact by blocking just one hydrogen donor. Uh, so we have another question. Um, expanding on kind of the observations that you showed right at the end, um, where it seemed like the canonical DRAC motifs uh, had this decrease, and then the non-canonical had this increase effect. Um, is that, these were a few examples, is that preserved transcriptome-wide? Um, and do you have any idea of mo other motifs that might be involved in those differences? Um, so I haven't had a, enough time to really explore that systematically yet. Um, so I just made these observations like late last week, and I've been traveling a lot for conferences. Uh, so it's something that I plan to look into and have a more systematic approach rather than just in these examples. Um, so at the present, I don't know, but it's something I'm going to look into. And then, uh, so another question is, do you have a sense of how comprehensive um, the scan of the transcriptome or the epitranscriptome will be with this data set? Um, so I haven't done a saturation analysis yet, but based on estimates from the 2019 uh, Nature Methods paper, where they was kind of the first benchmarking of direct RNA sequencing, they estimated that about 50 million reads were required to reach saturation of the poly-A RNA of a cell. And we're getting 
with our four replicates, about 17 million reads per sample. And so we're close to the estimate of the saturation based on that paper, but I haven't looked specifically if we have looked at the entire transcript, the entire poly A transcriptome with those data so far. And perhaps just building on that too, uh, the point, there's a point to emphasize as well that, so there's a hand, you have all these signatures in the nanopore data, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily, you know, you have some models to predict some of them, but there's only a small fraction. Yeah. And so this IVT design will allow you to tell, will tell, tell you every spot that has a modification, although you might not know what that modification is. Exactly. Yeah. So with this data set, we have the potential to find every possible RNA modification in these cells at this point in time that we sampled the RNA at. Um, so I had just a couple of questions. One was um, with the glucose stimulation, I'm not from the diabetes world. Is it sort of standard to do one hour or is there like a time series in which you kind of... Um, so the, the I'm also not from the diabetes world. I'm a nanopore guy. But my understanding is that it's usually to look at like one hour, two hour, four hour, eight hour, 12 hour. Um, and there's going to be a differential response along that entire time. Um, So it's not standardized. Oftentimes, an hour is uh, is done. Um, we just actually, earlier this year, had a study where we actually did the time course on primary islets. Um, and uh, so it will be interesting to come back to and do an, a follow-up based on that, which says four to eight, you get the optimal transcription response. So it's very interesting that we, already within an hour, though, you're getting all of these modifications. So... Um, Kind of repeating that in a in a time course will be yeah, interesting, interesting as well. See what that is. And and then my other question is kind of a little bit more um, sort of technical about how you deal with kind of the batch effects because you show that there are different um, read depths, for instance, for the different things and so on. How do you manage that in your? Um, so in the binomial regression, we're nor we're using the depth of each sample as a normalizing factor. So we're getting like counts per million on at each of the sites. And then we're also um, controlling for the sequencing date um, as another variable in the binomial regression. So we are trying to control for those batch effects because they can be very impactful. Uh, thank you. No, oh, thank you. Good questions. So I think that's all. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Logan, for coming. Uh, it was a great, great talk, and it's going to be exciting to see how this data set uh, unfolds in the next uh, few months as, as oh, yeah. we analyze it.